Presently, we are looking at Cauchy's theorem. So, what what is the Cauchy's theorem? Cauchy's theorem is a partial converse of Lagrange Cosset theorem. What Lagrange Cosset theorem says that a subgroup is there, then its order divides the order of group G. Converse is if order of some a number m divides order of group G, does there exist a subgroup of that order? That is a partial, uh, that is a converse of Lagrange theorem. This is not true. But Cauchy was the first one to answer this in a positive way partially. So, what pa Cauchy's theorem says that if G is a group whose order is divisible by some prime P, then there exists a, an element of order P. That means, the group generated by that order uh, element X is of order P. So, we are going to prove it today. So, I have stated the theorem, written down the statement of the theorem here. Now, we let us define sigma, a set sigma which is P tuple of elements of G. So, what is sigma we have defined? It is the order P tuple of elements of G such that their product is equal to 1. So, I collect them into a one set which we call it as sigma. Now, let H be a cyclic group of order P. So, what do we mean by cyclic group of order P? A group generated by one element whose order is P. Say, generated by by sigma. Thus, sigma raised to P is identity. Now, this group H, I am going to I define an action of H on sigma. So, define sigma of G 1, G 2, G n, G p is equal to just one cyclic shift to the left. So, it is G 2, G 1, G 2, G 3, G p, G 1. So, you can see what sigma does is it rotates the vector cyclically by one place to the left. Now, we will prove that if product G 1, G 2, G p is identity, that is what uh, elements of sigma are made of, of, then this is also identity. So, let us take the product now G 2, G 3, G 1, G 2, G 3, G p, G 1 is equal to I multiply here by G 1 and G 1 inverse to the left. So, it is G 1 inverse G 1, G 2, G p, G 1. I have not done anything, I just added to the left which is identity. So, nothing changes, but if you look at the middle term G 1, G 2, G p which is equal to identity because it this p tuple belongs to sigma. So, this is equal to g 1 inverse identity g 1 and which is equal to identity. That means, if I move this vector by one place to the left, shift it, then still the product of component is equal to identity. What does it mean? Sigma takes a vector in sigma, small sigma takes the vector in capital sigma to itself. That means, sigma acts on capital sigma and sigma generates the group H. So, H acts on, on the group G. So, that is what we are. So, we have defined now the action of, we have defined the action of H on the sigma. And what is that action? Just move this 
generator of H takes this rotates the vector to the left by one place cyclically and the resultant. So, this sigma is invariant under cyclic shift means cyclic shift of a vector inside sigma is all belongs to sigma. So, H acts on sigma that is what we have proved. So, this with this action it gets. So, we have to proceed as before we have to look at the orbits of this H h on sigma. So, that is what we are going to show. Thus, h acts on sigma. Now, as I mentioned last time, number of elements in sigma, we can arbitrary choose g 1, g 2, g p minus 1 arbitrarily and choose g p such that the product is equal to 1 identity. So, it is mod g raised to p minus 1 because g 1 can be chosen in mod g way, g 2 can be chosen in mod g way except the last one. Once we have chosen first p minus 1, the last one is fixed. So, the, the, there are so many choices. The, since mod h, h contains p elements, order of h is p, the orbits of h on sigma are of length. Length means number of elements in the orbit is either length either the orbits of h on the are of length either p or 1. Okay? Now, all the orbits are not of order p because there is one orbit which is of length 1. What is that orbit? Choose g 1 is equal to identity, g 2 is equal to identity, g p is equal to identity and the product is equal to identity. So, it this when all g i's are equal to e, it belongs to sigma and it is on this h x, it maps that element to it into itself. So, h has at least one orbit of length p, I am sorry length 1. So, let me write it down. So, length is either p or 1. Now, E E E is in sigma and sigma of E E E is equal to itself. Hence, there is at least one orbit of length 1. All other orbits cannot be length p. Cannot be of length p. Why? Since otherwise mod sigma is 1 plus some multiple k p, because all other orbits are length p, then there they will cover k p elements and one orbit is like this, which is not true. Since p divides g mod g. Hence, there is an orbit of length 1. That means, length 1 means under cyclic shift that p tuple does not change. That means, all the elements of that uh, co coordinates are same. That is, g g 
is in sigma for some g in g. So, there exists a g such that this p 2 pul g g g belongs to sigma, but what does it mean? It belongs to sigma means the product of the components of that vector is equal to identity. Because let me repeat, what we have what we have located one orbit of length p. We have found out that not all orbits can remaining orbits can be length p because length ones because then sigma will have one plus some multiple of p element, but that cannot that cannot be equal to g rest to this because p divides g. So this sigma p divides this mod sigma, so it cannot be equal to 1 plus k p. So, some other orbit must be of length 1, that means that the orbit of the, is of the form g g g g p times and such that their product is and g raise to p is identity. And we got the element of order p, because g is not equal to identity, because the, this orbit is other than the orbit this orbit, so g is not equal to identity and g raise to p is equal to identity. And this proves the Cauchy's theorem. That is what we wanted to prove that if, if, if p divides order of group g, then there exists an element of order p in that group g. So, this is a partial converse to the Lagrange Cosset theorem. We will have some more converses like Silos theorem or in case of some special groups, types of group which are known as solvable group, there are many more converses, very important converses to the Lagrange Cosset theorem. So, this is the first in that series. So, what we have done is we have proved the Cauchy's theorem using this orbit method. I am going to give you one more proof which is also equally good. This is a very nice proof. It gives this is the defining sigma is a very important breakthrough here. Now, I am going to give you one more proof, totally independent proof. So, let me, so this is the proof number one. So, let me now give you the proof number two. So, proof of Cauchy's theorem number 2, number 2 proof means, so proof is as follows, proof is by induction on G. The reason I am taking this because we will be proving lot many theorems using induction. This is the first time we are using the induction method, induction on mod g. Suppose, suppose g is abelian. Then, choose choose any g not equal to e if order g is equal to n then g raised to n is identity if p divides n, that is p is equal to sum or n is equal to sum m into p, then g raise to m p is equal to g raise to m raise to p is identity. And thus g raise to m is the required element.
is the required element. Now suppose m does not divide p. Suppose p does not divide n, then let h be g mod the group generated by g, then mod h is mod g divided by mod divided by n and since p divides mod g and p does not divide n, p divides mod h. And by induction, there is, there exists one element of H, but H is, H is, the uh, element of H is the coset of this, exists G n such that G raised to P n is equal to n. That is, G raised to P is in n. I'm sorry. This is this should be there exists. So, I should change this g 1. Let me call this g 1 and therefore, g 1 raised to p raised to n is equal to identity or g 1 raised to n raised to p is identity. And thus, and thus, G1 raised to n is the required element if G is abelian. Abelian means every element commits with every other element. So, in case, so we have proved this Cauchy's theorem in case of G is abelian. Now, suppose G is not abelian, again we will use the uh, method of induction. So, case 2, suppose G is not abelian. Suppose G is not abelian. So, we have studied the class equation. So, let me write down the class equation for G. Then, the class equation of G gives mod G is equal to mod Z G plus C G g mod c g x i x i c g x i is not equal to g. So, these are the classes containing more than one element, there are some and classes are disjoint and these are the classes which have only one element that means, because they belong to belong to the center of the group. So, conjugacy class is that element is by itself and that totally must be equal to g. Suppose p divides suppose p divides z g then 
by the first case because this is there exists G in ZG of order P. And this G is the required element, required element. So, we have, uh, we have finished the case when P divides ZG. Suppose P does not divide ZG, then because left hand side is multiple of P, this cannot be multiple of P. Then the second sum, the, the second term in the above on the RHS is not divisible by P. Hence, P does not divide G mod C G X i for some i, because each if each of them divides P. Uh, is divisible by P, then sum is divisible by P, this mod G is divisible by P, then ZG is divisible by P, but we have assumed that it P does not divide this. So, some term here, one, at least one term is not divisible by P, but this since P divides mod G and P does not divide this, therefore, P divides C G X i mod. Since C G X i mod is less than mod G, we have uh, C G X i is not equal to G. So, mod number of elements in C G X i is not equal to mod G. By induction, there is a G in C G X i of order P and this G will serve our purpose. So, we have proved now. So, let me repeat what I have done. We have written down the class equation. Left hand side is divisible by P. Suppose this is divisible by P, then by Induction by first case, abelian case, there is a exist an element of order P in ZG, but ZG is a subgroup of G. So, that element belongs to G and is of order P. So, we have finished this case theorem in this case. Suppose this is not divisible by P, left hand side is divisible by P. So, this cannot be divisible by P. So, some term is not divisible by P, but if that term is, suppose this term is not divisible by P, then P divides C G X i mod and mod of C G X i is less than mod G. So, by induction, there is an element of order P in C G X i and that element can be taken as the element of G and it is of order P and therefore, we have finished the proof of Cauchy's theorem in the second possible. When P does not divide ZG and it exhausts all the cases. So, we have done in two steps. This we have proved this in two steps. One is abelian case and second is non abelian case. In second case, there are two sub cases. One when ZG is divisible by P, mod of ZG is divisible by P and second case is it is not then one of the term here is non uh, is not divisible by p and therefore p divides this c g x i mod and by induction because c g x i is strictly less than mod g mod of this and therefore induction can be applied and we get the required element of order p in g so this is a very basic theorem the first theorem of this kind what is this cauchy's theorem says that if p divides mod g 
then there exists an element of mod element of order p and we have finished the proof. Now comes, so mathematicians were trying to find the converses to this Lagrange Cosset theorem. This was the first time. So, what other order when, so this is when p divides, p the prime which divides order of group G. Then came very important breakthrough in this and that was by Silos theorem. Okay? So, now we are going to state and prove the Silos theorem. So, let me write down the theorem, statement of the theorem of Silos theorem. So, Silo theorem says that if p raise to a n is the exact order of p, power of p dividing mod g, then there exists a subgroup of order, uh, that order. So, that is a very important thing. So, it is a, will not prove at present complete full theorem. Silos theorem, part of it, and then we will continue and prove the remaining parts later on. So, Silos theorem, partly, in part. Major, this is the major the part of the, the Silos theorem. Let p raise to n divides mod g, that is, p raise to n divides mod g, but p raise to n plus 1 does not divide mod g. That is, n is the exact order of p dividing exact power of p dividing g, mod g. Then, the Silos theorem is a very important result, then there exists a subgroup of G, say S, with mod S is equal to P raise to S. So, this is again a partial converse of Lagrange Cosset theorem. That means, if group is of order 24, then 2 raise to 3 is the largest power of 2 dividing 24, then Silo theorem guarantees that there is a subgroup of order 20, uh, subgroup of order A, there is a subgroup of order 3, because 3 is the largest power dividing 24. So, we are going to give three proofs of this theorem. All of them are very important. So, let me do one by one. So, first proof. Proof number one. Again, by induction, we prove the theorem by induction. We prove the theorem by induction on mod g. So, so let we write down the class equation. Again, mod g is number of elements in z g plus g mod c mod g divided by mod c g x i c g x i mod c g x i is less than mod g. This is the class equation. So, 
okay so this is what so how do we how are we going to use the induction algorithm now let us consider if if p divides small g as before if p mod divides small g mod z g that means order of uh, p divides the order of z g the number of elements in z g then by cauchy's theorem we are not going to we are not using the full theorem it's theorem for abelian group remember we had two parts one is for abelian case and non abelian then by cauchy's theorem there is a exists g in g and order of g in zg and order of g is equal to p now since g belongs to zg this subgroup generated by g which is of order p is in zg is normal in g because it belongs to zg and every element of g zg commutes with every other element so the subgroup generated by g is of order uh, is normal in g and no order of mod g is equal to p because g is of order p hence g mod z g this sub consider the factor group it has is exactly divisible by p raised to n minus 1 why because order of this subgroup in the bottom is of order p so it has p raised to n exactly divides mod g so p raised to n minus 1 will divide this and mod so by def, by induction assumption this group has order p raised to subgroup of order p raised to n minus 1 okay so now we use the induction assumption to get a subgroup of order p raised to n minus 1 in this group and the inverse image in g will have exact order required so that is what our strategy is so let me re repeat what i did i wrote down the class equation the first case is if p divides zg then there is a element of order p in zg but so that element is in the center of g so a group generated by g which is of order p is normal so we go consider the group g mod the uh, subgroup generated by this g which is exactly divisible by p raised to n minus 1 and this is being less than mod g order by induction assumption by induction p raised to there is a subgroup a small this group generated by of g mod g of order p raised to n minus 1 hence mod s is p raised to n since mod g is equal to p that is s is a subgroup of g of of the order p raised to n and this is the required group which we wanted because we wanted a subgroup of order p raised to n we got it we did it using class equation and the first case when p divides zg 
Now, we return to the case 2. Suppose, P does not divide mod G, mod Z G, then P does not divide the second term on RHS. Hence, P does not divide some mod G divided by mod C G X i for some i. for some i. What does it mean? P raised to n divides mod g, but P, rest, P does not divide this. So, P raised to n is the total power which is, which divides this bottom order C g x i. Hence, P raised to n divides C g x i mod. Since, C g x i mod is less than mod g by induction, C g x i has a subgroup of order P raise to n, which is also subgroup of G and it is of order mod uh, P raise to n and that is what we wanted to show. So, this gives the required subgroup. So, the theorem is completely proved. So, this is called a first part of silo subgroup theorem. So, what it may gives us is the guarantee that if P raise to n is the largest power dividing mod g, then there is a subgroup of order p raise to n. Okay? So, we have proved it in one way. Now, we are going to prove in two diff more different ways, because they are more instructive and very nice proofs are there. So, even though the, the same theorem is being proved, the techniques they are used are different and very nice and they will be useful later on for us. So, I am going to prove the same theorem using different proofs. Okay? So, let me start the proof number 2. Proof of the same theorem we proved just now, but using different proof. So, this proof is by Wieland. This is this proof is by Wieland, very beautiful proof. So, how do we proceed? So, let let sigma again I am going to define a set sigma. Sigma is subsets of G mod A is equal to P raise to N. So, I collect all the subsets of G of order containing P raise to N elements. Let P raise mod G equal to P raise to N into M, where P does not divide M because P raise to n is the largest order dividing P, the mod, mod G. So, mod G can be written as P raise to n into some no, integer which is not divisible by P. Then, how many elements are there? So, how many subsets of G are there which are of or uh, containing P raise to n elements? Then, number of elements in the sigma is P raise to n m p raise to n. This is the binomial coefficient, because this is the number of ways you can choose a subset of 
order or uh, cardinality p raise to n from the sub set of cardinality p raise to n into m, where which is g. Now, this I can write it as p raise to n m minus 1 p raise to n, oh, this is p raise to n m into p raise to n m minus 1 up to p raise to n m minus p up to p raise up to 1 divided by. So, how, how far it will go? It will go up to divided by p raise to n factorial into p raise to n minus I have just written down the binomial coefficient and you can prove that the numerator and denominator all the p all the p's can will be can be cancelled and so what you get is an integer which is not equal to mod 0 you can check that all the prime of p factors which are powers of p can be cancelled and what you get is an integer which is not divisible by p so it is called so it is non zero mod p okay so that is p does not divide mod sigma now let g act on sigma by the rule g into a is equal to g a that is replace every element of a by or multiply every element of a by g so what is g a how does g act on an element uh, on sigma so you take an element of sigma which is a set containing p raise to n element and multiplied by g you get another set which contains same number of elements since g a is equal to mod a is equal to p raise to n g a is in sigma that is g x on sigma since number of elements in sigma is not multiple of p some orbit is not length is not divisible by p since p does not divide mod sigma there is an orbit o containing contained in sigma such that number of elements in that orbit is not divisible by p because if every orbit length is divisible by p then number of elements in sigma will be multiple of p but it is not we have proved we have mentioned here p does not divide then mod sigma that means you can locate at least one orbit whose length is not multiple of p okay so choose that orbit Hence, orbit O looks like how it looks like A1, A2, AK, where K is the length number of elements in orbit and K does not divide, P does not divide K. And each AI 
is equal to p raised to n. Okay, so uh, that is what we want. Now, g a one. What is g a one? Stabilizer of a one. So this is equal to number of elements in this g in g. G a one is equal to a one. This is equal to number of mod g divided by mod o, which is and since. P does not divide divide O. G A one mod P raised to n divides G mod G divided by mod O. Thus, P raised to n is the exact power divisible dividing G A one by induction. Since g a one is less than mod g, there is a subgroup S of g a one, which is a subgroup of g of order p raised to n. And this is the required subgroup of order p raised to n. So, so let me see what we did. We define the sigma, which is a subset, all the collect all the subsets of uh, cardinality p raised to n in G, and show, uh, showed that the, the, that sigma has order which is not divisible by p. So sum, and we define action of G on that sigma. So some uh, orbit will not contain elements uh, uh, length which is multiple of p. So p does not divide this that particular orbit length mod o. That so p raised to n will divide exactly divide mod g by mod o because p does not do divide o mod o. So this, which is equal to order of g o stabilizer of m a one, which is a subgroup, is divisible of p raised to n, and therefore, and by induction, therefore, this subgroup contains a subgroup of required order. So, this is the proof of Silo's theorem in second possible by second method. So, this is also very nice proof. Then third proof is also very interesting and it uh, deals the method is totally different. So let me, I am not going to prove it in detail, I am going to prove, sketch you the proof. If you are interested, you can work it out, it is not very difficult. So what I am going to do is, there are three, three steps to the proof. One, so let me describe those three steps or at least give the sketch of the proof for these three steps. So let me write down the third proof, sketch the third proof of Silo's theorem. Proof number three. 
just sketch. I am not going to prove it in detail. If you are interested, you can prove it. So, step number one. Prove that if H is a subgroup of G and G has a silo subgroup, what do you mean by silo subgroup? In earlier notation, the subgroup containing p raised to n element exactly. Then H also has a silo subgroup. So, this is the step 1. So, step 1 says that if G satisfies silo theorem, then its subgroup, any subgroup, it satisfies silo subgroup theorem. What we want to show that every subgroup, every group satisfies silo subgroup theorem. So, essentially, we are going to, we want to prove that there is a, every group is a subgroup of some other group which satisfies silo subgroup theorem. So, step 2. So, so, it is enough to prove prove that any subgroup, any group G is a subgroup of a group H which satisfies, which has a silo subgroup. Because step 1 will give that G will have silo subgroup. So, step 2. So, step 2 is we will show that this, so this is the step 2. So, step 2 is actually I should have called this as step 2. So, how do I prove that given any group G, you can embed it into a bigger group which satisfies silo subgroup theorem. So, now, G is a sub is a subgroup of S mod G. And this is a symmetric group on G. All possible sim, uh, permutations of G, that is group of all the permutations of G as a set. Now, consider sigma g in S mod g, sigma g h is g h. Now, we can show that then g going to sigma g is a homomorphism from G to S mod G 
which is injective. Hence, sigma g forms so set sigma g g in g is a subgroup isomorphic to g. Hence, sigma g g in g is contained in a small g is a subgroup contained in this. Now, so we have got and this is isomorphic to G. So, this is a subgroup contained in this and G is isomorphic because there is a map from G to H G, G going to sigma G. So, image is a subgroup of H G which is isomorphic. Why isomorphic? Because it is injective. Okay? So, we have got, so G is a subgroup of a small g, thus G is a subgroup of a small g. Now, there is a map, map H mod G to G L mod G Z. Let me explain what it means. So, what we are going to do is take a permutation of G and map it into a invertible matrix which is a permutation matrix. So, so what? So, so, how, so we can show that, that there is a mapping, this is this is not very difficult to prove, but I will not go into detail. I will just sketch. So, there is a map, in, uh, there is a one to one map from S mod G to G L and Z. Okay? So, th thus there is a map, there is an injective map from G to G L N Z to G L N Z P, where Z mod P Z, where Z mod P Z is the mod uh, ring modulo P P. I will not go into detail, I will just, those who are interested you can work it out. Thus, any group G is a subgroup of G L, actually it is mod G, G L mod G Z mod P Z, where P is the prime for which we want to prove the existence of pseudo P group. Now, consider matrices which are upper triangular with diagonal entries equal to 1, all the diagonal entries to be 1. So, they are like this. 1, 1, 1, it is 0 here and then these are arbitrary elements. Then, then this is a subgroup, this is a silo subgroup. 
Philopi subgroup of G L mod G Z mod P Z. Hence, G has a silo subgroup, silo P subgroup. QED. So, this is the group we wanted to find. Now, we have displayed actually this is a silo P subgroup of all the invertible matrices with entries in G, mod G by mod G invertible matrices with entry in Z mod P Z. And this is the silo P subgroup because if you calculate the order, this order is P raised to something which is the maximal power of prime dividing the order of this. And we have got this group. This is a silo subgroup. And G is a subgroup of this. So, G has a silo subgroup by first step, first step. So, this is also very nice proof, little bit complicated, but it is very informative and educative. So, that is why I give one the sketch of this proof. If you are interested, you can prove the unproved statement in this proof. So, th these are the three three different proofs of silo subgroup theorem. Now, so what we have proved, if P raised to n is the exact order power dividing mod g, then there is a subgroup of order P raised to n. That is what we have proved. But silo, when he proved this theorem, he proved so many other things. So, let us take one by one. Let us take them one by one. So, let G be a group with P raised to n exactly divides mod G. P raised to n is the largest power of P dividing G. Let S be a subgroup silo subgroup, silo P subgroup of G. That is mod S, S is a subgroup of G and mod S is P raised to N. Since S is a P group, ZS the center of S is not equal to identity. Hence, there is a an element G of order P in S. Then S mod G has order P raise to n minus 1 by induction S mod G has subgroup of all possible orders. order namely 1 p p square up to p raise to n minus 1. Then inverse image of these groups in S have order We pull back orders P, P square 
up to p raised to n together with identity identity subgroup we have s having subgroup of order 1 p p square p raise to n. That means, but these subgroups of S are subgroups of G. Hence, G has subgroup of order 1 p p square p raise to n. So, what let me repeat what we did. What silo theorem, the first part of silo theorem gave us that there is a subgroup of order p raise to n, but we had studied the p group and S is a p group of order p raise to n. So, it has a non trivial center going and Cauchy's theorem gives the element of order p in that zg. So, going modulo zg, we get this subgroup of order p raise to n minus 1 by induction there are subgroup of order p p square up to p raise to n minus 1. Pulling this subgroup to s, you get a order p p square p raise to n together with identity will give all the possible orders. So, we have proved the general generalization of silo subgroup theorem, which says that if p raise to n is the largest power dividing mod g, then there are subgroups of order 1 p p square up to p raise to n. So, this is more a stronger theorem than silo subgroup theorem. Okay? So, so, for example, if you have a group of order 24, then it has a group of subgroup of order 1, 2, 4 and 8 it has a subgroup of order 1 and 3. Let us take for example, subgroup of order 34, then it will have order subgroup, a uh, group of order 30, 32, then it has a subgroup of order 1, 2, 4, 8, 16 and 32. So, this is a powerful theorem. Okay? So, this is offshoot of silo subgroup theorem. Okay? So, what we have proved is there exists at least one, but silo gave how many subgroups of order p raise to n are there. So, now second part of the silo subgroup theorem is equally important. So, let me write down the statement of second part and then we will prove it. So, part 2, part 2 of the second uh, silo subgroup theorem, let g equal to p rest, mod g is equal to p rest to n into m, p does not divide m, then the number of subgroups of p silo subgroup that is subgroups of order exactly equal to p raise to n. They are called a silo subgroup and p silo subgroup and the existence is guaranteed by part 1. But now part 2 gives you exactly how many of them are. Then the number of p silo subgroups of G is equal to 1 plus k p, where k is in z plus, k is some non-negative integer. That means, for example, p is 2, then G will contain at at 1, 3, 5, 7 element uh, silo p subgroup, not so number of silo p subgroup when p is even is odd. That is, 
p does not divide the number of of silo p sub group p silo sub group this is very important we will have lot of application of this result so how do we prove it again we are going to define a set on which g will act so let s be one of the silo sub group then consider the set sigma of left coset of s in g that is sigma is x1 s x2 s x k s x m x where m is mod g by mod s which is p raised to n m divided by p raised to n which is m. Hence, number of element in sigma is m which is relatively prime to p does not divide m. So, number of elements on sigma is not divisible by p, this is very important. Now, s acts on sigma as follows. T in s, for T in s, P is operating on or acting on x i s is T x i s. It is another coset. So, it acts like a now s is fixed under this x by s under this axis. So, S is fixed by action. So, let us see how many other, how many orbits are there of length 1. Now, x i s is an orbit. is an orbit if T x i s is x i s or for all t or x i inverse T x i is in s. Or x i inverse s x i is equal to s. That is x i is in the normalizer. So, x i normalizes s. So, x i is in normalizer of s in g. Thus, this is and converse is also true. Conversely, if x i 
is normalizer in of S in G, then X i inverse S X i is equal to S or what we want okay so let me use Okay, so here P x i s is equal to x i. So conversely, okay, or s x i is equal to x i s, or s into s x i. Is equal to wait a minute. P x i s is equal to x i s. Ah, okay. Or multiplying both sides by s, x i s x i into s is s into s, which is s because s is a subgroup. That means s x i s is x i s. Take x i to the left, left, right hand side. That is x this coset x i s is fixed by s. Under, under the above action. Hence, x i s is an orbit of orbit and of x of s. Hence. Number of orbit of orbit of length one is equal to number of elements of NGS normalizer divided by number of elements of S. So, length one is remaining orders wait a minute x i ok I will continue this next time because the proof is little bit longer. So, I will continue this next time and I will deal with some other important corollaries of Philo subgroup theorems.
and also give lot of applications of Silo subgroup theorem, but I will do it next time. Thank you.